On the 14th of March 1989, 21-year-old University of Texas student Mark Kilroy was kidnapped in the city of Matamoros in Mexico whilst enjoying a trip away on spring break. After extensive searching, his body was found on the 11th of April 1989 at a remote ranch in the Mexican desert, the compound of a cult known as Los Narcos Satanicos or the Narco Satanists, led by this man, Adolfo Constanzo, who preached that human sacrifice would make his followers immune from law enforcement interference into their drug dealing activities. Mark's mutilated remains were found buried on the grounds of the property and showed that he'd been sodomized and tortured for hours before his death. His brain had also been removed and boiled in a cauldron. As if this horror was not bad enough, the remains of 14 other people who died in a similar fashion were found buried on the compound, although it's believed the cult murdered over 20 people. This is just the tip of the horror found at the ranch, which was scattered with bones and blood and human organs, including brains and hearts being found in a cauldron. The scene was described as, quote, a human slaughterhouse. The violence and depravity are outlined in the case of the Rulo cult, headed by Michael Wayne Ryan in the 1980s, powers into insignificance compared to this group. So please, prepare yourself to plumb the depths of complete inhumanity. Welcome to Evil Among Us. This video comes with a proviso and a warning. Firstly, this is a complicated case. There are contradictory narratives in various sources, even in books that have been published. This mainly seems to revolve around details of dates that victims other than Mark Kilroy died, but I've tried to be as accurate as possible. Secondly, a warning. This case is extremely disturbing and involves graphic descriptions of torture and murder. So please, if this is likely to offend you, end the video now. So. Mark James Kilroy was born on the 5th of March 1968 in Chicago, Illinois, in the Midwestern United States. He was the son of James William Kilroy, a chemical engineer, and Helen Josephine Kilroy, a volunteer paramedic. Soon after his birth, the family relocated to the city of Santa Fe in Texas, which is where Mark grew up. He was a polite and studious young man who, since his early childhood, had always wanted to be a doctor. He was a popular student and excelled in his studies at Santa Fe High School, but was also a keen sportsman, including being on the basketball team. Mark did well on his SATs, and, when he graduated from high school, obtained a place at the University of Texas at Austin to study medicine. He was well on his way to realising his dream. During his first year at college, he spent spring break with his friends in the town of South Padre Island in Texas, which lies on a barrier island off the coast of the state. This was, and still is, a popular destination for students due to the beautiful landscape and party atmosphere. It's also a mere 20 miles from the US-Mexico border, so students often drive or walk across so they can enjoy a quote, two-nation vacation. Unfortunately, despite the party atmosphere and the beautiful scenery, this area of the United States, particularly the border between South Texas and Mexico, is extremely dangerous and today is the most significant drug smuggling corridor along the whole 1,954 mile US-Mexico border. This is due to the large number of border crossing points, 17 in total, which is more than the combined number of entry points for two of the other states which border Mexico, California and New Mexico. There's also the opportunities for maritime smuggling along the Texas coast. Given that this is the heart of the drug trade, it's also the epicenter of organized criminality. This region is controlled by the various cartels who have committed horrific acts of violence in order to protect their turf and the multi-billion dollar drug trade. An epicenter of this criminality has, for decades, been the city of Matamoros, which is just over the border from the city of Brownsville, and some extremely dangerous men roam the streets, including Sicarios, or Hitmen, and Falcones, or Falcons, whose job it is to be the eyes and ears on the street, spying on rival cartels' activities, but also looking for victims, whether these be Mexican, US, or any other nationality, to smuggle drugs across the border. However, in the 1980s, there was another group roaming the streets of Matamoros, henchmen for a dangerous cult, looking for victims to be sacrificed in order to convince their deranged followers that they now had magical powers. Mark Kilroy could not have known this, and so in 1989, as soon as spring break came round, he wanted to return to South Padre Island in Texas, but also explore across the Mexican border. On Friday, March 10th, 1989, Mark and three of his friends, Bradley Moore, Bill Huddleston, and Brett Martin sat out on the nine-hour drive to South Padre Island. They arrived on Saturday the 11th of March 
and began parting and sunning themselves straight away, having a good time. In the late evening of Sunday the 12th of March, the group headed for Matamoros, crossing at the city of Brownsville, joining around 15,000 spring break revelers for more partying. The group returned across the border into the US in the early hours of Monday the 13th of March. After spending the day recovering and sunbathing, they decided to return to the border city of Matamoros. At around 11pm on Monday the 13th of March 1989, the four friends, Mark, Bradley, Bill and Brent, parked their car near the crossing at Brownsville and walked across into the city of Matamoros. For the next few hours the group passed and drank, but around 2am on Tuesday the 14th of March, they decided it was time to return across the border. At 2am, they began walking down the main strip and approached a bar called Garcia, where Bradley and Mark separated from the group to relieve themselves behind a tree. Bradley soon returned, but Mark had disappeared. The friends were not too concerned at this point. They thought that Mark had just wandered off. But, after searching for him for two hours, they began to worry. This was a time before mobile phones, so there was no way to contact Mark directly. At around 4am, they crossed back over the US border and went back to South Padre Island, hoping that Mark would either be there or would soon reappear. He didn't. What the group didn't know was that when Mark went out of their sight to relieve himself behind a tree, he was approached by two men, Serafin Hernandez and Mario Torres, who quickly bundled him into a van. These men had been looking for a human sacrifice, specifically an American, and they were now driving Mark to his horrific death 20 miles away, in the Mexican desert, to a place called Rancho Santa Elena, the compound of Los Narcosatanicos, or the Narcosatanists, a place where so many had already been tortured and brutally executed. This place of horror was led by a sadistic psychopath called Adolfo Constanzo. Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo was born on the 1st November 1962 in Miami, Florida. His mother was a woman called Delia Aurora Gonzalez. I've not been able to find out the name of his father, but he died when Constanzo was very young. Delia was born in Cuba and was a follower of a religion known as Santeria, which translates to, quote, Way of the Saints. Santeria is polytheistic, i.e. belief in many deities, known as orakai, and there's a strong belief in rituals, and that by performing these tasks in a specific way, a person can be given protection from evil and misfortune in their life, as well as imbued with spiritual and sometimes supernatural powers. These rituals can include dancing, drumming, speaking and eating with the spirits. Two specific parts of this belief system are important. Firstly is the practice of giving offerings to the orakai, which can include fruit, alcohol, flowers, and sacrifice animals, although this latter practice is not as common as when the belief system formed in the late 19th century. Secondly, part of the belief system, an important part of this case, is that a human head contains the person's essence. However, like any belief system, there's always a flip side. Whilst those practicing Santeria appear to believe that the spirits they worship are good and will protect them from evil spirits, those who follow Palo Mayombe, which has been called the quote, dark side of Santeria, believe they can achieve the same outcomes, protection, spiritual and supernatural powers, by pleasing evil spirits. It's here where the belief in human sacrifice and horrific acts of torture and degradation fit in. The more horrific the act, the more power is given to the participant. From a 1991 Washington Post article, I found the following quote. In the rituals of Palo Mayombe, we learn, it's important that the offering die in confusion and pain, and most of all in fear. A soul taken in violence and terror could be captured and used by the priest to turn into a powerful, angry servant. Spellcasting seems to be a feature of both belief systems, but in Palamayombe, it appears the purpose of these and the steps to achieve them are rooted in horror and evil. Many of these spells, quote, require bodily fluids such as sperm or blood, which the believers consider sacred. Even the most benevolent ceremonies and spells require the blood of animals, usually chickens, to be offered to the spirits of the dead. However, as we'll see, the potions needed to be brewed for these spells and rituals sometimes contain human body parts and organs. This inhuman concoction would be made in a sacred cauldron, called an Nganga. This is just a summary of my research. I'd never heard of either belief system before looking into this case, so I tried my best to condense a lot of articles and documents. It may not be spot on, but I get the impression that, to put it simply, Palamaombe can be seen in line with devil worship to a greater or lesser extent. The path that Adolfo Constanzo would take was set when he was just six months old, when Delia had him blessed by a Palo Mayombe priest 
so apparently placing him on the side of Satan. This doesn't seem surprising when looking at the family's background. It appears that much of Constanzo's extended family were involved in organised crime, with many of them being cartel members. Delia was known to the police due to being a thief. For some reason, Delia convinced herself that her son was, quote, the chosen one, and chosen for great things, putting into this child's head that he was somehow special, better than everyone else, which was a concept in his twisted mind that would only grow as the years progressed. As a child, Constanza was described as never laughing and obsessively neat. He appeared strange to adults around him as he didn't act like a child. By the age of four years old, he'd already developed an obsession with his appearance, including making sure he didn't leave the house unless his clothes and his hair were immaculate. As I stated earlier, Constanza's father died when he was young, and after his death, when Constanza was around five years old, his mother took him to Puerto Rico, where she soon remarried. The new husband was Catholic, and so Delia went along with this and hid her true belief system. Constanza was baptised, and bizarrely, was even an altar boy for a short time. However, Delia would frequently take her son to Haiti, telling her husband they were visiting family. In fact, they were there to learn about Haitian voodoo. Again, this appears to be another belief system, where rituals and spells are performed in order to gain power from spirits, including animal sacrifices. It's recorded that both Delia and her son were involved in these rituals. Edward Humes' book on this case, called Berry Secrets, includes the following quote, Adolfo Constanzo's earliest childhood memory was not of a favourite toy or a parent's smile, but the gurgling death rattle of a chicken slit throat, its blood offering up to the ancient African gods. He knew a home filled with decay and blood, inuring him to death. His reward for good behaviour was the gift of an animal to mutilate or kill. It's clear that Delia was a woman obsessed with spirits, connecting with and drawing power from them, and would seek out any religion which she believed she could learn from in order to achieve this goal, which, as I've already outlined, appears to have been underpinned by a belief in the power of evil. How old Constanzo was when he was exposed to all of this is unclear, but it was before he eventually returned to Miami in 1972, so he would have been less than 10 years old. We're reading about this case, I noticed that many articles use the word cult when talking about voodoo, Santeria, and Palo Mayombe, and I can see why. This may be an unfair characterization, but I've noticed that each belief system mentioned seems to have a single person or group of people in charge who are seen as almost divine, with followers fawning at their feet, following their every word and command with the promise that, if they do, they'll be elevated above other mere mortals. However, these people are clearly motivated by wanting to wield power over people, and, in some cases, a sadistic desire to harm others. Shortly after Constanzo moved back to Miami at the age of 10, Delia's second husband died. After this, she moved to Little Havana and openly practiced her various beliefs, with clients paying her money to cast spells to bring them good fortune. The neighbours didn't take too kindly to this, and they would sometimes find the bodies of headless goats and chickens on their doorsteps. Delia found another husband within less than 12 months, a local drug dealer who also had the same beliefs. He passed his wisdom to the still developing Constanzo, telling him, quote, let the non-believers kill themselves with drugs. We will profit from their foolishness. Constanzo attended school in the US, but was eventually expelled, and instead became an apprentice of a local Palo Mayombe priest who was teaching about various spells and rituals, which almost always included animal sacrifices. However, his education also included how to manipulate others and how to make as much money as possible from the shows he would put on for those often desperate people looking for answers. Adolfo Constanza rose through the ranks quickly, in no small part because of his mother Delia, with her claiming that her son could see into the future and that he predicted the shooting of Ronald Reagan in 1981 and could speak to the dead. People would flock from miles around to visit the young sorcerer, who would read tarot cards and sacrifice animals to bring them good luck. This spiritual service didn't come cheap though. Constanza could get these gullible people to pay whatever he wanted, and he did. In 1983, age 21, Adolfo Constanza moved to Mexico City, looking for new opportunities. He was charismatic, good-looking and charming, and soon set himself up as a sorcerer, and again people would flock from miles around to pay him for his services. His clients went from local residents with a few dollars to the rich and famous, including actors, models, doctors and property moguls. He soon built up a client list of around 30 people who would pay him anywhere up to $4,000 a session for him to slaughter an animal, put it in a pot, say some magic words, 
and promised the earth. Amongst his clients were corrupt police officers and government officials who were in the pockets of the cartels. He soon became a trusted spiritual advisor to drug lords and hitmen alike. The level of superstition these men had and the amount of influence that Constanzo wielded was substantial. Cartel bosses would even schedule their drug shipments based on his advice, which he obtained from communicating with the dead. Constanzo was in an infallible position. He would make the most outlandish claims. He claimed these spells could literally make people invisible from the eyes of the police. He also told people that, after a visit from him, they would be bulletproof. If he was wrong, especially regarding the bulletproof claim, there's often no one to come back and complain, but he would simply say they had not followed his instructions or had misconstrued the meanings of his premonitions. This same year, 1983, Constanzo apparently pledged himself to Satan, but in other versions of the story that I've read, he potentially said that he was Satan himself. Rapidly, Adolfo Constanzo amassed a following of people who worshipped him like a god, and he soon began to claim that his cauldron needed human remains to increase its power. In 1985, he and three of his followers went to graveyards and dug up corpses, dismembered them, and added these parts to his cauldron. Whether Constanzo actually believed in any of this is something we'll return to later, but it seems as though this vile drink was consumed by his followers eagerly. However, within a year, Constanzo declared to his ever-increasing cult following that the cauldron needed flesh from recently deceased humans, those who had been tortured, as this way, he could entrap their souls in this vessel and use them for evil until the end of time. Around this time, in 1986, Constanzo began to direct his followers to bring in people to torture and to kill. Over the next few years, bodies started appearing on the streets of Mexico City, showing signs of torture and often missing parts of their body, including limbs. These were predominantly drug smugglers. These body parts ended up in Constanzo's cauldron. In 1987, Constanzo was introduced to the Calzada family, a powerful cartel. The patriarch of the family, Guillermo, quickly bought into Constanzo's performances, so the reason why his drug shipments were getting through was because of him. Constanzo was soon a wealthy man, owning a fleet of luxury cars and a condominium in Mexico City. Constanzo soon demanded to be a full partner with the family, but this was refused. In April 1987, Guillermo Calzada and six members of his family disappeared. In his office, police found evidence of a religious ceremony, including an altar and candles, both of which were soaked with blood, evidence of the practice of Palo Mayombe. A week later, the remains of seven people, the missing Calzada family, were found floating in a local river. The remains showed signs of torture, with fingers, ears, toes and genitals removed, all apparently while the victims were still alive. Two of the bodies were missing their brains, but the spine had been ripped out of one. These missing pieces had all ended up in Constanzo's cauldron. Adolfo Constanzo sought out other cartels to join, no doubt to become even more wealthy and powerful than he already was. He wanted an introduction to another powerful clan, the Hernandez family, and looked for someone to open this door for him, which, while still in 1987, brought him into contact with a woman called Sara Aldrete, who was born on September the 6th, 1964, in the city of Matamoros, Mexico, but she spent most of her childhood in the US, attending school in Brownsville and Texas Southmost College. She was a striking woman, standing six foot one inches tall. She was also the cousin of a drug smuggler who had ties to the Hernandez family. However, her main link to them was that one of the brothers, Elio, was obsessed with her. Constanzo realized if he could befriend her, he had an in. How the two met is unclear, but it appears that Constanzo set up a chance meeting with Aldrete and drew her into his web, beginning with tarot card readings, and then her involvement in sacrifices, both animal and human. Through her, Constanzo got the introduction to the Hernandez family he wanted. Within months, Aldrete was second in command of the cult. She would use her looks and charm to recruit men from the streets. She was in charge when Constanzo was smuggling cannabis into the US. She was soon dubbed La Madrina, the godmother, whilst Constanzo was called El Padrino, the godfather. Recruits would be forced to watch the 1987 film The Believers over and over again. This film was about a psychiatrist, played by Martin Sheen, who gets drawn into a New York City-based cult that engages in human sacrifice in order to gain money and power. This movie was to get the followers used to the concept of human sacrifice. Aldrete's role would not solely be confined to recruitment. She was actively involved in the horrors to come, being at several of the murders and directing the torture of at least one man, which we'll come to later. Constanzo impressed the members of the Hernandez crime family to the point where he soon became their spiritual advisor. The movements of drugs between Mexico and the US 
would only occur with his say-so. Constance's involvement with the Hernandez family became even more important to them when, in 1987, the head of the drug operation for the family, Saul Hernandez, was assassinated by a rival clan. So the new boss, Elio Hernandez, looked to Costanzo for a way to ensure his family's survival within the drug industry. The way to do this, according to Costanzo, was to sacrifice as many people as possible in order to give the family protection from their enemies. Many of the Hernandez family were drawn in by Constanzo, including Elio's nephew, Serafin Hernandez. In late 1987, Adolfo Constanzo moved his operation to a property owned by the Hernandez family called Rancho Santa Elena, 20 miles outside the city of Matamoros in the Mexican desert. This was not just a compound for Constanzo's followers, but also a hub for drug trafficking, with huge quantities of cannabis and cocaine being stored on the grounds. How many members of the narco-Satanists that actually were is unclear. The numbers vary wildly from conservative estimates of 20 to some sources saying it may have been as many as 10 times this number, although some of its members would end up being murdered and replaced. With the isolation space of the ranch, the ritualistic murders increased in frequency and brutality, all to obtain body parts of the cauldron to summon power from evil spirits. How many people were killed at the ranch is unclear. It was at least 15. It's clear the targets chosen by Constanzo were for his own enrichment and included drug dealers as well as corrupt police officers, both working for rival cartels, thereby eliminating the Hernandez family competition. Adolfo Constanzo took a lead role in almost all of the murders. On May the 28th, 1988, he shot a drug dealer named Hector de la Fuente and a farmer named Moises Castillo. However, soon, according to him, the sacrifices had to be even more horrific and that, to have the desired effect, the victims had to die screaming in agony. So, in July 1988, he supervised the torture and dismemberment of another man called Raul, a former lover of one of the cult members, whose mutilated body was dumped in the streets of Mexico City with his organs and limbs being put in the cauldron. Another unnamed victim was dispatched in the same manner in August 1988. It should be noted here that as with other cult leaders, the compound was seen as a way by Constanzo to wield complete control over his followers. The property was isolated, so the cult was cut off from the outside world. Travel to and from the compound was strictly controlled. The attention was only to expose cult members to other cult members, so their collective insanity would be reinforced amongst the group. Part of this shared delusion was the belief that Constanza was somehow divine, all-powerful, and his word was law. He set various rules including no use of drugs and no television. With regard to the last point, this was intended to cut off contact with the outside world. Of course, the rules were meant for the followers, not for Constanzo. He would regularly scurry off to drive around in his luxury cars and spend time in his luxury condominium in Mexico City. However, violation of Constanzo's rules meant death. In November 1988, Constanzo ordered the torture and murder of a man called Jorge Gomez, who used drugs, which was something that was banned. This murder was used as an example to others not to violate Constanzo's rules. In terms of what torture was used, this appears to have escalated as time went on and apparently included an occasion where a man's penis was cut off and his chest cut open and his ribs pulled apart by hand and his heart removed while the man was still alive. It should be noted that many of the victims were only raped, often by multiple group members, including Constanzo, over a number of hours before their deaths. On the 14th of February 1989, Constanzo ordered the torture and murder of three drug dealers in a single day. Their bodies were hacked apart, their bones and organs boiled in water and the liquid consumed. Those who pleased Constanzo with their level of devotion to depravity were rewarded. For example, Elio Hernandez, the de facto leader of the Hernandez family, was ordained as an executioner priest and branded with a hot knife, with him later showing authorities the arrow that had been seared into his skin, signifying his rank. The captives would be held in a barn where they would be tortured, then they would be moved into a shed on the property where an altar had been set up with burning candles. The ceremony would involve alcohol and those watching the horror would scream and holler, throwing themselves around, apparently having convulsions as spirits entered their bodies. It must have been something out of a nightmare. The victim would then be dispatched. It appears that all the victims were male. The type of victim selected was apparently based on the type of spell that Constanzo wanted to perform. If he wanted to perform a spell to give a cult member strength, they would seek out a well-built man and, after his murder, his muscles would be cut away from his body and put in the pot. If he wanted to cast a spell to give someone eternal youth, 
that they would target children, use their body parts and blood. For what I've been able to gather, at least two children were amongst those murdered. One of these deaths shows the depravity of this group, as if this wasn't already clear, and their fixation on finding people to sacrifice. On the 23rd of February 1989, a corrupt police officer called Cesar Sosida was abducted and brought to the ranch for execution. However, he struggled as soon as he realised the fate that awaited him, and Elio Hernandez pulled out a gun and shot him. Constanza was displeased by this, and stated that because the victim hadn't died by torture, his body parts could not be used, and so they needed another victim. Serafin Hernandez and two other cult members jumped into a van and sped off looking for another target. The van drove down Mexican Federal Highway 2, which connected the ranch and the city of Matamoros, when they spotted 14-year-old Jose Luis walking on his way to feed animals at a neighbour's ranch. The boy was bundled into the van, a bag placed over his head, and he was driven back to the compound. The boy was then taken out of the van, and, without removing the bag, Elio took a machete and brought it down the child's neck, decapitating him so the head fell into the bag. When he took the bag off, he saw to his horror that it was Jose Luis, his cousin. The body was promptly disposed of. On the 13th of March 1989, Adolfo Constanza declared that another human sacrifice needed to take place so that a spell could be cast to protect a shipment of illegal drugs from the authorities. Constanza specifically stated he needed a human brain, the rationale appearing literally to be that if a brain was included in his next concoction, then they would be able to outsmart the authorities. However, Constanza was more specific. He stated he needed a brain from an American college student, as this would be bigger and more intelligent. So in the late evening, he sent his followers into the streets of Matamoros to find a victim. Mark Hillroy was the unfortunate person, out of thousands out that night, who was selected for this sacrifice. The Santa Elena compound to me sounds like the definition of hell on earth, a place of absolute horror, murder and destruction, a place where one psychopathic man directed acts of pure depravity and evil. It was this nightmare that awaited Mark on the 14th of March 1989. So, we left the story of Mark Kilroy earlier, with him having been approached by two men, Serafin Hernandez and another cult member called Mario Torres. The men apparently spotted Mark when he was relieving himself behind a tree, and they approached him, with Mario saying, quote, Do you want to ride? Before he could react, the men bundled him into the van. The date was the 14th of March 1989. The time was approximately 2am. Serafin was driving, but soon stopped as he needed to urinate. With the van stopped, Mark took the opportunity and managed to scramble out of the vehicle, and began to run. Mark began to sprint towards a car behind them, looking for help, but, instead of finding salvation, he was confronted with other cult members who were in a second backup vehicle. Mark was attacked and bundled into the car, a knife held to his throat to ensure he didn't try to escape again. The vehicles then drove in convoy, taking Mark on his last journey and his horrific death at Rancho Santa Elena. What happened next is not known precisely as there were different reports, but it appears the most likely sequence of events is that Mark was tied up and gagged in a barn initially. A few hours after his abduction, an aged caretaker at the ranch called Domingo Reyes spoke to Mark, and gave him some water and made him some eggs as he said he was hungry and his gag was removed so he could eat his last meal. Then the torture began, with Mark being cut, stabbed and burnt by various followers. He was also gang raped. This went on for approximately 8-10 to 10 hours. Leading the torture was Adolfo Constanzo, who it stated was one of the men who sodomized and tortured Mark. I've read that his second in command, Sara Aldrete, was apparently present, but it's unclear if this is the case or what her involvement actually was in the torture of Mark. It was believed that the ritual needed to be done within 13 hours of the abduction, so by 3 pm, or the spell would not work. So just before 3 pm, Mark Kilroy was led, blindfolded due to the duct tape over his face, with his hands behind his back to the cabin where the executions took place. All the time he was begging for his life. Candles were lit and chanting began, and Mark was forced to lie on his stomach, but then lightly forced into a kneeling position with his neck exposed. Adolfo Constanza then took a machete and brought it down on the back of Mark's neck. Some reports indicate this decapitated him. However, the majority I've read suggests this didn't actually remove his head and instead severed his spinal column. Either way, the result was the same. Mark Kilroy, a man with a promising future, who just 13 hours ago was partying with his friends, had been sacrificed as part of the belief system of a deranged cult. As soon as Mark was dead, the 
group set about dismembering his body. The top of his head was cut open and his brain removed. His legs were also cut off above his knees to make it easier to bury him. His fingers and his penis were also removed. A wire was inserted into Mark's spinal column so that once the body had decomposed, the bones could be pulled up from the ground more easily. This was apparently so that Costanzo and other cult members could eventually wear Mark's vertebrae around their necks for good luck. Mark's brain was then taken and fed into the bubbling cauldron. A goat's head, chicken feet, a turtle shell, a horseshoe, coins and animal blood were all added. The ingredients apparently needed for Constanzo to cast a spell to protect a drug shipment. In the late morning of the 14th of March 1989, Mark Kilroy's friends were concerned. He had not returned to South Padre Island and they not seen him now for approximately eight hours and they knew something was wrong. So they crossed back over the border into Mexico and reported Mark missing to the US Embassy. They were brushed off, being told that Mark had lately been arrested in Mexico for some minor infraction, would soon be released and stumbled back across the border, little worse for wear, later that day. Unsatisfied, Mark's friends crossed back into the US and filed a missing persons report with the police in Brownsville. However, when US police approached their Mexican colleagues, they refused to help them. They stated that according to their records, Mark had crossed back into the US and so it wasn't their problem. Whether officials were covering for the activities of the cult or were simply incompetent is unclear, but the investigation to Mark's disappearance came to a grinding halt before it had even begun. It appears the only reason why Mark's disappearance was actually taken seriously was due to his uncle, who worked for US Customs, calling in favours and putting pressure on agencies on both sides of the border. This resulted in a major investigation being started. The Kilroys, their friends and both US and Mexican police forces searched for Mark, posting 200,000 flyers in both Spanish and English all along the Rio Grande Valley. They offered a $15,000 reward for information on Mark. Mark's parents met with officials all along the border and his case was featured on America's Most Wanted. However, it would be the stupidity of one cult member who would, luckily, bring an end to the activities of Los Narcos Satanicos but not before two further human sacrifices occurred. The last of these occurred on either the 28th of March or the 1st of April 1989 and involved a man named Gilberto Souza, whose ordeal began by being hung from a beam. Sarah Aldretta then directed this man's torture with him being lowered into a barrel of boiling water while she told others to cut off his nipples with scissors before he was murdered. The reason why she was chosen to take the lead was apparently because Souza used to be her lover this last sacrifice was apparently to ensure that 800 kilos of cannabis arrived in the US safely and the specific spell using the body parts of Souza was to make the cult members literally invisible and bulletproof. Belief in this nonsense is what led to the downfall of this murderous cult. On the 9th of April 1989, Serafin Hernandez was driving back from smuggling drugs over the border when he drove straight through a roadblock which had been set up to detect drug traffickers. The armed Mexican police were stunned by his brazenness but, instead of opening fire, they decided to follow the vehicle and were led all the way back to Rancho Santa Relida. It appeared that Seraphim was genuinely surprised the police could see him and they arrested him. A quick search of the ranch revealed the presence of cannabis and cocaine and cult paraphernalia, but rather than searching too extensively, the police made a number of arrests. This included four cult members, amongst them Seraphim Hernandez and Elio Hernandez, as well as the caretaker for the ranch, Domingo Reyes. The puzzle pieces quickly fell into place. Domingo Reyes saw a picture of Mark and confirmed that he'd been at the ranch and he'd even spoken to him. Serafin Hernandez, who from everything I've read was essentially brain dead, freely confessed to everything, not just the death of Mark, but multiple other murders and explained that the victims were buried at the ranch. He also identified Adolfo Constanzo and Sara Aldretta as the ringleaders. Serafin's willingness to recount his crimes appears to stem from him believing that because of the magic cast by Constanzo, he was immune from prosecution, so he could confess everything and there would be no consequences. I would love to have been in the room with him when it dawned on him that he'd put the nails in his own coffin. On April the 11th, 1989, the police descended on the ranch and the horror of Los Narcos Satanicos was finally revealed. Over the next five days, the grounds of the ranch were excavated as well as a nearby orchard, also owned by the Hernandez family. The bodies of 15 men were eventually recovered, including the horrifically mutilated body of Mark Kilroy, which was found on the first day. 
all of the corpses showed signs of prolonged torture and were missing various parts of their bodies, including ears, noses, limbs and their genitals. Others showed signs that their chests had been pulled open and their hearts and other internal organs removed. Police also recovered Constanzo's cauldron, which was brewing with blood, spiders, scorpions, a dead black cat, a turtle shell, bones, deer antlers, and pieces of a human brain, Mark's brain. In the shack where the executions took place, the police found blood caking the walls and floor, and, along with bones and clumps of human hair and skin, they found an altar, unused candles, and broken bottles of alcohol. Human skulls, bones and teeth were found scattered throughout the property. A federale, our seraphim, who was ordered to direct them around the property, why he removed Mark's brain, and he responded nonchalantly, quote, it was our religion. The discovery at the ranch meant the call had to be made to James and Helen Kilroy to tell them the fate of their son. The horror in this case is beyond belief. It wasn't just bad enough that their child had been murdered, but the nature of his death was so brutal, so unnecessary. However, the bravery of this pair is amazing, and I'll return to them later. Adolfo Constanza was tipped off about the police activity at the ranch, and so he, Sara Aldretta, and three other followers fled and holed up in the apartments of a sympathetic mother and her children in Mexico City. The remaining loyalists included Constanza's bodyguard, a man called Martin Quintana, as well as another man called Alvaro Valdez, a professional hitman. They were also heavily armed. Aldretta, knowing that the writing was on the wall, began to plot her defence. She was going to claim that she was an innocent victim that been kidnapped by the cult. On the 2nd of May 1989, she dropped a note from the window of the apartment block, which read, quote, Please call the judicial police and tell them that in this building are those they are seeking. Give them the address, fourth floor. Tell them that a woman is being held hostage. I beg for this, because what I want most is to talk, or they're going to kill the girl. A passerby found the note, and thinking it was a joke, discarded it. On May the 6th, 1989, Neighbours called the police about a loud argument in the apartment Constanza was holed up in, as well as thinking they heard gunshots. Police attended and were instantly met with gunfire. This led to a 45 minute gun battle, where miraculously, only one police officer was injured. With the walls closing in, Constanza issued his last orders. He told Valdez to kill both him and his bodyguard, Martin Quintana. Valdez let us describe what happened next. Quote, I told him I couldn't do it but he hit me in the face and threatened me that everything would go bad for me in hell. Then he hugged Martin, and I just stood in front of them and shot them with a machine gun. The monster that was Adolfo Constanzo was dead. He was just 26 years old. The police eventually broke in and took a picture of the scene inside the property before arresting all those left alive in the flat. With Adolfo Constanzo dead, his followers were left to face the music alone. In total, 14 cultists were indicted on various charges, including multiple murder, weapons and narcotics violations, and obstruction of justice. We'll focus on the outcome of the main antagonists. In August 1990, Alvaro Valdez was convicted of killing Adolfo Constanzo and Martin Quintana, and he was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. On the 3rd of May 1994, Elio Hernandez and Serafin Hernandez were both convicted of multiple murders and sentenced to 67 years imprisonment. However, this was then reduced to 50 years imprisonment in 1998, with it being argued that this was the maximum sentence that could be imposed for capital murder in Mexico at the time. I've left Sara Aldretta until last. Despite being identified by several cult members as Constanzo's second in command and heavily involved in the murders, she denied her guilt claiming that she was an innocent victim because she had been kidnapped and tortured by the cult. The authorities didn't believe her lies, and in 1994, she was sent to prison for 45 years for her role in the atrocities of the narco-Satanists. She has continued to protest her innocence ever since, and in around 2008, she released a book giving her apparent side of the story. Bizarrely, she was actually allowed to do press conferences about the book and earn money from it, you can still buy an autographed copy today. However, she can bang on about her innocence all she wants, from her prison cell, where she remains to this day. If she's ever released, the American authorities will be waiting to prosecute her for her role in the murder of Mark Kilroy.
the bravery of James and Helen Kilroy is remarkable. They didn't crumble after the death of their son. It appears their faith was pivotal to this, with them believing their son was now in heaven and they would join him one day. They decided to spend their remaining time on earth trying to do some good and keep their son's memory and name alive. And that is exactly what they did. The Mark Kilroy Foundation is still going today, over 30 years later. The website states, quote, the mission is to provide anti-drug scholarships, at-risk youth intervention, and summer programs. I'll leave a link to the website in the description. If you could donate your time or money, then please do so. Total respect for James and Helen. I'm sure Mark would be very proud. This is an extremely interesting and terrifying case. The headline is that Adolfo Constanzo was a sadistic psychopath and a master manipulator. I can imagine his name is not well known to many of you, but I believe that he should be held up as one of the most evil cult leaders of all time. The thing about Constanzo, which stands out when looking at this case, is just how powerful he was. He died when he was only 26 years old, but he was one of the most powerful figures in the Mexican underworld. Literally drug shipments would not cross the border without his say so. Gang bosses and even hardened assassins would not act without his blessing. But what created this monster? The starting point is his mother Delia. In terms of neglectful and problematic parenting, she pretty much sits on top of the pile. From the moment that Constanza was born, she continuously told him that he was special, above everyone else. He was exposed to things that children should never see, and as I said earlier in the video, it appears that his earliest memories were murdering animals, and this was celebrated, killing was good, and I've no doubt that Constanzo liked having this power of life and death over another living being. Delia also introduced her son to beliefs which seem to stem entirely from evil. I've no real indication anywhere in what I've read about Constanzo that any part of his childhood was not characterised by darkness, a belief in the power of evil and the way to progress in the world was by harming others. Nothing in his childhood would have come close to teaching Constanzo about empathy for others or enabled him to develop a conscience. So, before he was even a teenager, you had a child whose upbringing was characterised by blood and death, whose mother had told him he was the chosen one. An important question is whether Constanzo believed any of this nonsense. We will never know, but I doubt it. He was both intelligent and a scarily efficient manipulator and tactician. I think he saw an opportunity to take advantage of a country where belief in magic and mysticism is commonplace. I read a recent article which says that approximately a third of Mexicans believe in magic and its ability to influence their lives and it seems this was far higher in the 1970s and 1980s. I think that Constanzo saw that by using these beliefs he could gain two things, power and money. He quickly realised he could essentially say whatever he wanted and people would pay him vast amounts of money. He was shrewd, so I've no doubt before any of his wealthy patrons sat down in front of him he knew exactly what they wanted to hear. The fact that he, as a young man, was sitting opposite people who were supposedly educated and was duping them into handing over wads of cash likely meant that his perception of superiority was increased. Eventually, he would have hardened gangsters, killers, likely double his age, cowering at his feet, begging for his guidance. However, the big money was in drugs and he tried to muscle in on this. He approached one family, they refused, so he directed his rabid followers to eliminate them. When he got his foot in the door with the Hernandez cartel, he knew he was set. He could indulge his murderous impulses, whilst also making as much money for himself as possible. He convinced them that in order to protect their drug shipments, they needed to slaughter as many people as possible, and I've no doubt that Constanzo felt a sense of ultimate power, making his proclamations and watching his followers scurry off to bring him any number of victims he wanted. The screams of his victims likely had nothing to do with his spells. It was all about him. He wanted to hear the terror in their voices, to watch them tortured, to take their lives, and dismember their bodies. Potentially, this gave him a sexual thrill. It appears that the unholy concoction he produced was drunk by his followers, and I imagine he sat there and was amazed by the fact that with a single word from him, his cult would guzzle liquid, which I imagine must have tasted foul and had pieces of flesh and brain floating in it. Another reason why I don't think Constanza believed any of the bullshit was his choice of target. Many of the people he killed were rivals of the Hernandez family or corrupt police officers 
who stood in his way. He also eliminated at least one cult member who defied him. In this respect, it's clear that his directions to kill, apparently from some higher power, always aligned with his own self-interest. In addition, as soon as the heat was on, he fled. He clearly didn't believe his spells gave him protection from the authorities. He wasn't an idiot. When he was cornered, like so many other cult leaders and mass shooters, he chose to commit suicide. There was no way this narcissist would have allowed himself to be shackled, paraded before the courts and betrayed as a murderer, a common criminal. He was far above that. And so, he used his power one last time and ordered his own execution. His death means that we will never know how many people Constanzo's cult murdered. Although 15 bodies were found at the property, it's believed the group killed around 26, but likely many, many more. All of these victims, due to one sadistic psychopath and his ability to manipulate others. However, going further than this, this case reinforces the horrifying fact that some people are willing to blindly follow the ramblings of madmen. This was a very heavy case, and I really want to know your thoughts about it, so please comment below. If you like the content, please consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button. Also, you can send a one-off payment to support the channel by clicking the thanks button. Please like, share and subscribe. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.